of these expert needle felters are using one technique that will make your needle felted items look absolutely adorable. Can you guess what it is? All of them have taken their creations to the next level with this one technique. Their skills at needle felting long fur. But adding fur is scary, Julie. How the heck do I needle felt fur onto my felted animals? Well, I'm glad you asked that question, Panda Cat, because I'm going to show you how easy it can be. And I'd encourage you to have a go at this technique by making something simple and small, like a fun furry monster. First off, are you going to have to spend ages needle felting a very firm base to be able to felt fur onto? And do you need to coat it in coloured wool first? Well, it depends on what you're making, but because I knew I was going to use beads and plastic eyes, and I wasn't going to felt many details onto the base, I didn't need to felt it as firmly as usual, but just enough so that adding the fur didn't change the shape of the base and make it a lot smaller. So if you're going to add a fine line, like a mouth for example, just be aware that having the base this soft might make adding it harder and cause an indent where the details have been felted. But do you need to cover it in a coloured wool? Well I tried both. I tried covering it with the colour I'm going to use for the fur and I tried leaving the core wool totally uncovered. I'll show you how they both turned out and the disadvantages of not covering it a bit later on. But obviously one advantage to leaving the core wool uncovered is that you save time. So let's get making this monster furry. As with most things needle felting there isn't just one way of attaching the fur but I'm going to show you the way I find the easiest and most effective. But does it matter what type of wool you use? Well yes it does. I'm afraid carded wool won't work for this as the fibres are short and go in all different directions. We need the wool strands to be long and aligned in the same direction. So you'll definitely need some merino roving or tops wool for this technique. But it doesn't have to be expensive. Before we can attach the fur we need to gently pull the strands from the end of your wool. If you feel it pulled taut then you're holding the wool too tightly or too near the end. And if you pull it with force you'll break the long strands rather than gently drawing them out. Lay three or four bunches on top of each other and then cut these into three or four pieces. The length you cut these is up to you. It depends on what you're making. However, I wouldn't recommend cutting them much less than three quarters of an inch long as that will make them more difficult to handle and attach. I've cut these into about one inch pieces. Next, you need to decide what direction you want the fur to lie on the part you're covering. So for example, if you think about a cat's tail, which direction would you stroke it? You'd stroke it from the back of the cat to the tip of the tail. Or I'd hope you would, or the cat's not going to be very happy. So in order to help the wool lie more naturally in that direction, you need to add the wool in the opposite direction to the way you'd stroke it. So I started adding the wool in rows from the tip of the tail working up towards the base of the tail. I'll explain how to add these rows in a moment. Oh, is this video all about me? No, you've already had a video made about you. I'm just using you as an example. Well, my fans won't be happy. What fans? Rude. Anyway, looking at my not so furry monster, I want the fur to lie downwards from the top of his head to his feet, or rather the base, as his feet will be hidden in all that fur. What feet? I can't see any feet. Shh, you're not supposed to notice that. So I'm going to start at the base and work a row of fur around the bottom. So take a batch of the cut wool and lay it so that the strands are running from top to bottom and the midpoint of the strands are near the bottom of the body. Then stab in a line along this midpoint with a fine felting needle. I'm using a 40 gauge triangular. Personally, I don't think you need to buy lots of specialist needles if you're just trying this technique. Use whatever fine needle you have. Can you see how I'm going over the line two or three times until there's an uninterrupted dark line without any areas like that where the fur looks lighter? Stab these lighter bits down to make sure the fur stays attached. Then once you're happy, fold the top half over the bottom half and stab along the top of the fur. This will make sure it's well attached and help the fur lie downwards and not stick out too much. Then keep taking sections of wool and continue around the base till you get back to where you started. Now where to start the next row? I don't think there's one right answer for this. You can space the wool out and use more wool on each row if you want, but I keep the rows relatively close together, probably around 3 sixteenths of an inch apart. This will make sure he's good and fluffy. Sometimes it can be a bit fiddly and you might struggle to work out where the next row should go, but don't worry about this too much. Needle felting is so forgiving, even if your rows go a bit wonky you can still achieve a really adorable furry effect. I love seeing how the creature transforms as you add the wool. It looks so different. What was that panda? Did you have a question? Oh yes, sorry. But Julie, how do I attach the fur around the mouth and eyes? 
Wow, thanks, Panda Cat. You just happened to ask the perfect question. Well, as you work your way up the creature, you'll need to decide where the fur stops when you felt around the mouth, for example. But don't forget that you can make the fur shorter in some places than others. I'll show you how to trim the fur to different lengths to achieve different results around the face in a moment. But also I found that leaving a gap around the eyes where I decided not to attach any fur made this little guy look a bit sad. Like he's got bags under his eyes from lack of sleep. Hey, no minute murmur, murmur, murmur. Oh sorry Trist. This is Trist by the way. Apparently he's not tired. He always looks like that. Anyway, for the blue monster where I had glued the joggle eye into an indent in the wool, I decided to add rows of blue fur that went right up to the edge of the eye, so that there wasn't a gap and the fur would splay out from the eye nicely. I think this gives a nice effect, which you'll be able to see later once the fur has been trimmed. So sometimes you may need to alter the direction of your rows to accommodate the shape and the features of your felted item. Before I share some more tips on needle felting fur, don't forget if you do have a go at adding fur, I'd love to hear about what you've made in the comments. Or message me on Instagram. Try not to worry about making mistakes. After all, it's a monster. Who's to say how it should look? And remember, they will look odd during the process. So how can you add different coloured markings to the fur, say to create a tabby cat kind of effect, or have patches of different colour? Ooh, are you going to give me long fur? Um, no, I think you look lovely just the way you are. Oh, thanks. To see which way of adding different colours was easiest, I decided to try two different methods. The first method I used on the one-eyed monster to attach some pink wool dots of different sizes. So I drew circles all over the core wool and roughly marked with a pencil where they would go. Then I started attaching the dots of pink wool before adding the main body colour. To create a circle of wool, I started by attaching a very short row of fur at the bottom, then with each row gradually getting wider and then narrower again to make a circle of pink fur. Then when adding the blue wool, working from the bottom upwards, I worked around the already attached dots of pink wool, filling in all the gaps. Whereas with the ginger monster, to add stripes of a slightly darker colour, I added the darker coloured wool as I worked up the body in rows, changing to the darker colour a couple of times to give it some dark stripes across the back. Then on top of the head I tried to create a tabby cat style of coloured markings, using the darker orange to create stripes going backwards. But this turned out to be quite tricky, even though I'd marked with a pencil where the darker bits of wool needed to go. It was difficult to make sure I'd added enough dark wool and I haven't achieved the distinctive stripes going backwards that I wanted. But you can see a bit of variation in colour on his head, so if I was to do this again I'd think I'd attach the dark wool lines beforehand and add the lighter wool orange around those lines as I did with the pink dots on the blue monster. Once you've added all the wool, don't worry if your creature looks a bit of a mess, as it will look completely transformed once you give it a haircut. Body fur, fur, That was some bad hair day. Some needle felters use a knit comb or an ordinary comb at this point, but I find they are difficult to shape the fur with and just end up pulling wool out. I find the best way is to comb all the fur straight outwards with a needle felting needle. This way you can see the length of all the fur. You can leave it mostly untrimmed like I did with Trist here. Mermo, mermo, mermi. Oh, I see. You don't like going to the barbers. Okay. The only bit I did trim slightly was between his eyes. So when it comes to trimming the fur, to make sure you have control over the length, take your time. Only cut off a small amount at a time until you're happy with the effect and gather up and use any wool you trim off as core wool or to coat another project. Don't forget to keep combing it with your needle to tease out any long strands. Also don't be afraid to add wool to the top lip like I did on the ginger monster or munchy as I like to call him. It's far too long so I trimmed it really short so that it doesn't hide his mouth but still gives a furry effect. I decided not to add fur to his nose though as I didn't think he needed it. With the blue monster I cut the fur all the same length which as you can see from this before and after made him look a lot more neat and tidy. Oh, oh, wee one boy. Oh sorry, yes of course. How about Spotster? Wee. Munchy, however, needed several different lengths. I cut the bulk of his body in a similar way to the blue monster, but gradually cut it from long to short from his forehead down to the top of his nose. As I mentioned earlier, the Spotster here didn't have a coating of coloured wool before I added the fur. And the disadvantage of that is you can just see a little bit of white base showing through the pink fur here, which wouldn't have shown up as much if the dot had been covered in pink fur first. But it's not too visible.
Hi guys, what are you doing? Well, you're not very brave monsters, are you? Before you start attaching fur to create your own little monsters, there are some myths about needle felting that might be holding you back from making your needle felted items look great. And in this video, I'll explain some needle felting myths that you'll really need to stop believing so that you can make your needle felted items look amazing. I hope this has inspired you to give long fur a go. Thanks for watching.